Okay, tonight we are going to do our kind of design review, design overview of our 2020 um, Robot Ultraviolet. Um, we have a few of the people who helped um, do the actual design and CAD work, um, some of the students here who are gonna talk about this one. Um, so it's not just gonna be my voice through most of this one tonight. Um, we'll go through the entire robot starting at the drivetrain going through the ball path um, and then looking at our uh, climber mechanisms as well. Um, so we're going to switch over the screen share um, and have Jack open up the drivetrain. He's going to kind of go over the beginning overview of that um, and we'll add in as needed. All right, Jack, you should be able to share. Okay, I should be sharing now. Yep, you're good. Well, that's fun. Okay, um, the drivetrain, the outer rail, they're both are two sheet metal parts. So basically just, it's this part, which creates the inner part of the box and then this outer part creates the other half of the box, and then it's basically just a box that contains all of the wheels and chain and everything. Um, we use 7 8 standoff in the drivetrain to just make sure it didn't collapse or get bent, because we've had trouble with that in the past. Um, we added, well, late in the season, we added wheel guards to try and protect from balls coming in because we realized that was a problem um, probably week six. Uh, after our first event, we realized that uh, Omni wheels were not a good plan, but we were kind of stuck with them. So to solve our Omni wheel issues, we tried to add these uh, Lexan shields for them to protect them from the sides and the front when we go over the berm. They were never actually tested on a field, only in the lab. Um, we still broke the wheels on the first version, but this is the second version that was never tested. So who knows how they work? Um, we've gone over our gearbox before a bunch. And then our bumper mounting is actually kind of interesting because we have this. I can show you actually how it mounts. with the bumpers. Oh, that makes sense. It's in a different configuration. I was trying to find where the bumper CAD was and I couldn't find it the other day, which- Yeah, it's configured I about this robot. <laughs> um, so basically there is a bolt hole in our bumper. There's a bolt that goes into here. And then on the other side, there's a T-nut that is screwed in. And then that holds the bolt into the bumper. And then on the, here we put a, uh, a custom hex shaft combined with a piece of flat, sheet, flat uh, tube. And basically it's an, it uses, it acts as a nut and clamps the bumper onto this slot. And then when it's loosened, you can slide it in, but once you tighten it, it can't get out of this loop here. So the bumper is stuck on, and then we have that in all four corners, which prevents the bumper from ever coming off really. We had no issues with it. Um, our belly pan is kind of interesting because we were planning on having forks. So the forks were meant to be here and here. So we had to kind of shave the belly pan off on the edges, but to do that, we actually needed to, uh, so to reinforce our belly pan, we designed these that mount with uh, right, with T-nuts as we kind of call them, and slots to strengthen the belly pan and stop it from wiggling down and bending down. And we had those on both sides of the belly pan. Um, what else? Um, oh, you wanna go over how the, um, the cross rails mount in? Oh, yes. 
Uh, I just get rid of it. Uh, the cross rails are mounted by a thread all going from here to the other side, but to position the thread all, um, let me just get this. To position the thread all, there is a 3D printed block in here, which allows us to position the thread all and keep it in one spot. There's one on both sides. Uh, um, what was they I the also talk about the um, the hole, the countersunk hole that are facing the same way, so you can actually insert the threaded rod. Uh, yeah, the threaded rod on the 3D printed block, there is a countersunk hole on one side. It faces the same way on both sides, which allows us to kind of not act, because uh, the threaded rod isn't ever actually per straight, so you kind of have to force it in. So you have to figure, it allows us to locate the hole easier and make assemb it makes assembly a lot easier on this. Yeah, so you would, you would, you would only ever assemble this robot by putting the threaded rod through one way and never the other way. So if you try to put it through the other way, it's almost impossible to get it to go through the holes. But if you put it through the way that has the concave or the uh, countersunk holes in both sides, it locates it much, much easier. Yeah. Um, and then it has space for rivets to be put into other plates that go on top of this and below it. So it allows for a rivet to also go into yeah, these without holes. without riveting into the 3D printed part, which doesn't work very well. So like another option could have been to do like heat set inserts there and bolt those in, but it was easy enough just to know the rivets are there. It would get a little bit awkward if we started drilling out those rivets and those got captured or something. So that may be something to think about in the future um, to avoid that and do threaded inserts instead might be an option. Uh, what else is there? Um, our pneumatic wheels, I guess. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about custom hubs. Nice. Um, so our pneumatic wheels use custom hubs. They could use the same hubs that Andymark wheels use. They're the same size, but we chose to design and produce custom hubs. So the inside is, I can't isolate inside of an isolation, but the inside part is a 3D printed part that kind of just sits on the inside and holds the bearings. The outsides are sheet metal so that we don't, uh, the wheel when it tries to expand outwards doesn't actually make it out. We tried making the metal exan at one point, but they started to break. So we made sheet metal just to be sure for the real ones. Um, yeah, so it's all the pressure is kind of right at the edge of those flanges where the tire bead is being held in. The polycarb wanted to flex a little bit as you started to increase pressure in the, the inflation pressure. Um, and then for, um, for mounting all the hubs and everything, there are heated heat set inserts into the 3D printed part for bolts for both the sprocket assembly and the outer um, the outer plates. Yeah, and half of the holes are meant for tapping and half of them are 3D inserts, so we're not actually relying on either method fully, um, ever. Yeah, we also, it just would have taken a lot longer to heat, heat cert everything. Um, so we can, and we can tap a little bit faster. So the heat, heat cert inserts probably have the, they have stronger strength for um, torque out, which is nice, um, but would have taken a lot of heat, heat set inserts if we're doing every wheel this way. Um, if we did every hole on every wheel. Yep, and then the assembly or the wheel assembly is held in by snap ring grooves here. So we use snap rings to hold them in on both sides. We started this in 19 and continued it to 20 and we'll probably continue doing it. Yeah, so that allows us, that whole wheel assembly becomes its own module so if we need to swap something, you pull the bolt, the whole thing drops out, and you're not worried about spacers or shaft collar locations or everything. Everything's perfectly located by the snap ring grooves laved into the shaft, um, and you can get spare parts really easily and everything like that. 
it was very helpful when we had to replace the Omnis a lot of times during Dripping Springs. Uh, yes, we had, we could um, have spares being built ahead of time and then coming back to the pit, we could just swap them with a single bolt pull basically. Um, so yeah, we didn't quite go over what what the concept of the drivetrain was really briefly. So ideally, we were moving to this thing called, we, we refer to it as a four plus two, right? You can um, see that it's offset, um, that it's not a normal six wheel configuration. So those back four pneumatic tires are all flat. They're not, there's no drop or anything back there. Um, and the front Omni is, so all, actually all six wheels are flat. That front Omni kind of lets us spin out and we're kind of getting some of the driving dynamics of what's commonly known as a two plus two, where you have two traction on one side and two Omnis on the other, um, while still getting, um, without having too much of the spin out that you get from that two plus two, like you, you kind of get, you get a lot, wherever, whichever side the Omni's in, want to drift sideways a lot, like it's pretty hard to drive straight. Um, by having the four traction wheels, you get some of the tracking advantages of having a full traction drivetrain while still kind of being able to spin out um, of some of the maneuvers because you do have, um, you don't have any of that scrub on one side of your drivetrain. Um, and it worked pretty well in testing. Um, and we were very happy about even when we were driving around doing things until we started breaking Omni wheels this year at our first event, um, just because of how um, how aggressive we were going through the dance floor, whatever the actual name of it was called. This, I actually don't even remember the real name of it anymore. Rendezvous, it's rendezvous zone. point, rendezvous zone, something like that. Um, yeah, and then the wheels themselves are actually from where are they from? What company? Uh. Ooh, Trampa. Man. Yeah, Trampa, Trampa Tire, Trampa Board, something like that. They're a UK yeah. electric or UK powered electric skateboard company. Um, and they're a little bit bigger than six inch diameter, but when you actually inflate them and get the robot weight and everything on them, they sit about three inches off the ground to their center axle, um, which works out nicely. Yeah, that's why we have it catted for the wheels to be flat on the bottom. Whereas on the top, we needed to design to have the space for six and a half inch wheels, but the bottom really didn't. So yeah, so when they're f yeah, yeah, so that that could, that's one of the big advantages of the pneumatic tires, especially these ones, is you can get a nice big contact patch that's a lot larger than any of the other treaded tires because they don't deform as much as we can get the pneumatic tires to. Yeah, and then the bumper wood was all CNC'd with slots into it to allow it to all fit together nicely. Um, I don't think there's anything else really. Yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, the tire guards only, or the ball guards only sort of worked. Um, we definitely still got a ball stuck in there through very, very tiny gaps. So if we were redoing this, we would try to figure out ways to... Yeah mitigate some of that whether we open this up um to have the balls able to exit if they do get sucked in um do some things to protect the chain runs to stop the, trying to grab the balls in as easily um possibly make the lexan even stiffer and closer to the wheels so it's harder to to form in places there's lots of things we could try that we just didn't realize it was going to be nearly as big of a problem as it ended up being this season uh, Okay, I think that's most of the dry train. Oh, yeah, so we, we mentioned we went to seven, eight standoffs. Part of that is just the bigger the OD of the standoff, you can kind of get a stiffer plate. Um, you just get more bearing surface um, compared to like a half inch standoff that like we had been using. We had been using tube axle. Um, and this method is also cheaper. So you have a 3D printed insert in here that doesn't even need to be the whole way through. Um, it just needs to be able to locate the bolt. Um, and as long as you you can figure out how to do get the bearing surface for the bolt and nut, there's some there's a potential for localized bending if you clamp it too hard. Um, you can start bending in the sheet metal plate, um, but there's some ways to avoid that too, whether washers or other things. Um, but ideally, you just make everything stiffer by having a bigger OD um, standoff than just the half inch one that we had been using, um, and it ends up being cheaper for us too because we're not using the tube axle anymore or anything like that. 
Um, okay, I think that's everything. Okay, um, if you want to stop the screen share, I can take it over and get back to the full robot. Okay. All right. Um, as we're going through this, um, if anyone has comments on the other parts of the robot, if I miss anything, feel free to interject. Um, okay, so we're going to go through the ball path um, starting at the intake. Um, Okay, um, let's let me, let's see if it'll let me put it down properly. Um, hopefully, I haven't tested this in a little bit. Uh, mostly worked, okay. Okay, so intake down is easier to kind of see what we're doing. Um, originally, we were using our same intake rollers that we used on our 2019 setup, where we had a 1.25 OD Lexan roller um, running on top of our 7 8 tubing um, that crosses between the Lexan plates. Um, and the issue was that was to get the ball all the way from the ground up over kind of this lip that we needed to be able to build our um, V indexer, um, V funnel, whatever you want to call it. Um, we needed more rollers to be able to make sure we had contact with the ball all the way through. Um, so during our mid season kind of uh, weight review, when we were trying to figure out ways we could pull weight out of the robots that we'd have. Um, wait to use in other places and just get the robot lighter. Um, we realized getting rid of a roller was one of the biggest places we could knock off some ounces. Um, and one of the, the initial idea was we were using pool noodles, um, which are about two, two inch diameter, a little over when you wrap them around um, the rollers. And it ends up not getting, um, it ends up working, but we, oh, several other teams said that they had durability issues when they've tried that in the past. I think there's some teams who try to use roll, uh, pool noodles as rollers in 2016 um, and they got eaten up sometimes. Um, so we were a little worried about that. So we wanted to figure out a different option and we went to um, this larger OD polycarbonate tube, um, which is, what is it? Two and a half inch OD. So um, this ends up being um, a pretty similar weight to the other system, since all we're changing is the OD of the polycarbonate tube and not, um, we had a polycarbonate tube there anyway, so it adds some weight, but not very much. And it's probably pretty on par with the pool noodle once you add all that in as well. We did have to come up with a different pulley mounting system since we couldn't just use the clamp on one we had used before, as if we were clamping on um, this OD of this pulley would get way too large if we were trying to clamp over the two and a half inch. Um, so because of that, we had to figure out how to build in a 3D printed pulley that would be under the polycarbonate tubing and mount to it. Um, so that's where we get this pulley here. Uh, it doesn't want to do what I want it to do. There we go. Um, okay, so... Oh, nope, that's even weirder. What is that? Why is that? Does this never get built up? Uh, yeah, it's two parts. <laughs> it only ever got built up as one, as, two, as one separate, as two parts, and then we just like export it, it together? Yeah, you exported the SJL together. Oh, yeah, we did. Okay, yeah, so this got, okay, so yeah, so we actually didn't even ever make this into its own part. We made, we left this as an assembly of a, of a two different modified pulleys um, that we just exported as an STL um, by itself, which is a totally reasonable way to do it, right? The 3D printer doesn't know any better. As long as this face is down here, it doesn't know if it's a single part or an assembly. Um, because a lot of the times what we do, and I'm almost certain that's probably what we did here, was this started, um, let me see if I can, uh, 
Let's see if I can resolve it. Um, so this almost certainly started as a VEX pulley. Yeah, so this is the model from um, an aluminum pulley from either VEX or some other site that just had the pulley teeth and everything already in it. Um, and then we just go through and add um, add material back in in certain places to like give it a flat bottom and things. Um, or we um, go through and cut out the interior um, here to, so it gets us big enough for our bearing bore um, and things like that. Yeah, so this would have been some sketch that we pushed back in and refilled in um, some areas that on a molded pulley, like what Vexels would be, um, would be hollow to save weight on an aluminum one. Um, but since we're plastic, we don't care if it's hollow because that is all set on the uh, 3D printed infill settings. So a lot of them are just modified vendor pulley models um, and those work totally fine for us. There's almost certainly the teeth geometry is not perfect, but for things like intake where we're not really worried about the torque rating of our belts um, and we're more worried about just making sure we can transfer the power over, um, they work perfectly well. Um, these were heat set inserts, right? Somebody yes. want to correct me? Okay, yeah. So that's why there's there's flats here, which allow us to um, kind of put the heat set in. So it's easier if you had like a, if you kept the full diameter of the pulley, it would get a little awkward if this wasn't flat. So we cut flats there to allow us to do that. Um, yeah, so then the pulley would have been printed like this on our printer. So that's why these walls are sloped. Um, and then you can put a flat here, since this is gonna be sub fully supported by the one underneath it. Then you print up again and you have some overhang. So you will get some kind of overhang and some drips in the fill and some like kind of droopiness in the filament here, depending on how, where the walls are, especially this like overhang out here. Um, but largely it doesn't affect the way the pulley runs. Um, so it's worked pretty well. Um, so yeah, so this would be where the bearing is and we wouldn't even have um, all of this was just there for where the shaft was and there would be a bearing holder on the other side um, of the entire tube. So each roller only had two bearings in it. Okay. All upside down. Um, they're not in, or they're, they're either not visible or they're not in the CAD. I could probably go find them, but there is another, uh, there's a blank kind of 3D printed cylinder here that just holds a bearing. And then there's another pulley down here that just has the um, five millimeter pulley on it to match this one. Um, we never got to the point yet where we were, we, at one point we were planning on being able to like change the speeds between these two rollers. At the moment, they're still running at the same speed, right? They're geared one-to-one, -one. I believe so. Um, I know there, there was talk at some point of making this front one a little bit slower so this one could kick it could kick the ball back out a little faster. I don't think we ever got there. Um, so these inner 7 8 tubes, just like our 2019 intake, they don't rotate at all. They just have star nuts in the end and are bolted into from the side panel. And then so all the rotation is done just on top of them. Um, our intake was powered by a Neo. Um, it's not translucent either, so it's easier to see. So yeah, so we have the side plate and we have a um, 3D printed spacer block here that allows us to mount into the Neo um, kind of through this spacer without having to have another sheet built up. So a lot of teams who are gonna use um, hex shafts and things will need like the Neo mounted here, then you have another sheet to support things or you have the hex shaft going through and the pulleys on the outside. Um, and that just ends up being heavier and more complicated than what we like to be able to do, right? So with our setup currently, if we need to take one of these rollers out, um, all we're doing is unbolting two things and the roller comes out instead of having to like slide hex shafts through bearings and locate everything and retighten things down with shaft collars or snap rings or anything like that. Um, there are little push on retaining rings on the ends of these rollers that hold the entire roller assembly together. So if we do unbolt it, nothing slides off. There aren't spacers or anything. Um, none of that exists in here to complicate anything. Um, did we ever, we didn't run these at an event, right? We didn't have these at Dripping Springs. 
No, they were yeah, so, after because we ran when we ran into the loading station, we would collapse it. Yeah, and when we ran into the uh, we ran into the uprights for the uh, rendezvous point as well. So yeah, anytime we, if we like dead centered hit our roller, if we ran into anything, we would collapse the we would collapse these side panels enough that the belt could slip. So this belt running down here, it would lose tension and it would run over either to the inside or to the outside and it would kind of stop this roller from intaking, which is a giant problem because you can no longer intake balls during the match. So as we were looking through solutions, the one that we ended up um, getting ready to test was basically building the stiffener plate that was a piece of quarter inch polycarb, which will already help, um, right? Because this is gonna be harder to bend than this piece of eighth inch but you're still not getting um, the resistance and the access you actually want. So by having this plate that's slotted into here um, to actually change these two, these two bolt distances now, instead of just having to bend these two plates, you actually have to bend this plate at a plane, which is much, much harder to do, right? Because you're bending across this full inch or so, um, and the Lexan just doesn't want to bend that way. Um, so it's very possible we could have done just this plate into here, which is something if we needed the weight back, we may have tried, right? We could have had a little T-slot and just bolted this straight to here. Um, but it made sense because we want to make sure we're getting these bolt holes exactly um, and making sure none of that bends in some other way um, to have this for now. There's definitely some other ways we could have stiffened this up if we wanted to, right? We could have also... Um, if we were going to fully remake these plates, we could have added some flanges. We could have bent the sheet metal um, to make it harder to collapse there, right? Just a flange across this face, this bend, um, possibly changing it where the radius is and stuff would have made that sheet more rigid immediately in that direction. Um, yeah, and all the additions were made after the decision to cut the forks, so we had more weight to deal with. Correct. Once we... Yeah, yeah. So once we were no longer doing our buddy climb, we were sitting 10 pounds or so under the weight limit. Um, okay, so yeah, so some of the intake things, we wanted a relatively wide intake, but we didn't want to push too far. Like these extra couple inches don't really help you with ball intaking all that much as the ball still need to be able to fit into our funnel. Um, so we weren't pushing out too far so we could have our... Um, Pneumatics on the outside, so the ball's not running into those at all. It's not doing anything. Um, the pivot up and down for this is really simple. They just, the uh, polycarbonate just sits on a 7 8 tube, just like the same 7 8 tube that we use on our intake roller, just this one's slightly longer. Um, it bolts into these side plates. Um, the reason we do our drivetrain this way with this outer, um, this bottom flange bent out is so we can rivet in these Lexan side plates um, and kind of mount to the very edge of our robot. Um, so this lets us put a bar spanning the entire width of our robot that acts as our intake pivot. Um, that bar also supports this plate so it doesn't drop. So that kind of sets our height. We at some point had, um, 3D printed blocks in here that I think we got rid of and just started zip tying, right? Um, I think there's there's 3D printed blocks in the back, but there we got rid of the ones on the front and that lowered the angle a little bit and that helped, um, or that worked, so we didn't need the extra part. Um, so we could reduce part count there. Um, yeah, so if the intake, the entire intake needed to come off, you could unbolt, the two bolts holding in this um, this tube, and then either um, the easiest thing to do would just be un uh, unbolt the intake um, clevises on each side, and then basically unplug the um, neo, and everything else, and the whole thing would just come off really quickly. So four bolts and a couple wires, um, and you could swap the entire intake if you needed to. Um, some zip ties and things as well, like always. Because anytime you're taking off a full subsystem, you're going to need to at least cut some zip ties. But relatively easy to um, pull in and out. Um, the intake, which we haven't touched on, did have another bottom bar here. Um, so we were squeezing the ball through a pretty tiny gap. Um, 
Is this the smallest gap or is the other gap the smallest gap? Does anyone remember? Min distance, we get it down to four two there. I think that's the small one. Because this one, yeah, this one's like five eight. Yeah, so we, we bring it down to about a four and a quarter inch gap. So we're pulling it up through, a, we're compressing the ball pretty heavily um, through our initial push. Um, but it seemed to not have any issues doing that since you're only compressing it that far through a very small amount of the ball, the ball's able to deform into our bumper over this rail and kind of over the other side of the tube. We're only a little bit along the center line of the ball is actually compressed to that number. If we were trying to compress the ball to 4.2 through two flat plates, that's much, much harder and takes a lot more force than doing it over through just kind of a center point with rollers um, as it's kind of just, compressing as it goes through and expanding on the other side. Um, yeah, so that bar is also there for our um, ball storage when we flip the intake up. Um, so when we go to the other configuration, I'm not gonna do that right now because it's gonna get, um, it takes a little bit, it's gonna get awkward when we go there. But basically that ball holds the balls in so they don't fall out this direction. If the intake was up and we didn't have that bar, um, any of the balls sitting in our funnel would be able to fall out very easily um, with nothing stopping them. Okay, um, on to the V funnel fully. So indexing and sorting the balls from this kind of wide intake into a single line was definitely one of the problems we focused on the most this year. Um, there were tons of brainstorming sessions on how to do it. Multiple different prototypes were built, um, different ways. There was a lot of um, discussion with some of the, our, um, some of the people who were also doing our op other open alliance builds and how they were doing things. Um, the team up in Canada, ooh, I'm gonna get the number wrong, 6135, Ethan, other people? Is that yes. right? 6135, okay, I got the number right. Um, 6135 released a video on YouTube really early, I think, by the end of week one or so, um, kind of showing this really basic prototype of a funnel thing um, that was getting the balls into a straight line very well. And that was always gonna be kind of our backup plan if we couldn't find one that we liked better. Um, and it ended up just not, none of the other ones we were looking through kind of got us where we wanted. Um, without having different jam points and things we were worried about just not working. And this was just every prototype we had of it um, just kind of worked with very little issues. Um, and then it was a matter of, okay, we know we're doing a V-Funnel. How do you actually go through and choose all the little implementation details, right? Um, I think our original prototype was hex shafts and they had like a second plate down here to support um, some bearing plates and to support some movement off of versus planetary and things. Um, and it all just gets more complicated when you have to do um, live axle things and you're supporting the shafts and you're assembling them and moving those shafts in and out of bearings, which we try to avoid at any situation that we can. Um, so the construction here, we were like, okay, so we're going to use a dead axle construction similar to how we use um, the seven, eight shafts up here. So you get these nice, wide, light, thin aluminum shafts um, um, that are white here that are just tubes that we put star nuts in again um, and a 3D printed part to act as the pulley. Um, these did have needle bearings in them as well, right? I believe. Um, they did. Okay. They had, they so each of these assemblies had needle bearings, which are 7 8 ID and 1.125 OD. So they're the same outside diameter as a half inch round or half inch hex bearing, um, but they have an inside diameter that is 7 8 round. Um, and so with that, we don't have to spin that shaft so that 7 8 shaft can kind of act like a standoff or a spacer between this bottom plate and this top Lexan plate. So we don't, um, the belt tension doesn't like try to flex this at all since this is this is resisting any um, 
flexing from the belt tension here. We did order wider belts. Uh, we did order wider belts than normal. So these are 30 millimeter wide. It's like double width compared to like what's on a um, AM1 for you, like the Kitbot robot, um, which are normally 15 millimeter wide. Um, that was probably unnecessary. Like you could almost certainly do it with 15 and not have a problem. So I don't think the bottom, the way we ended up mounting it and things, the bottom of this belt almost certainly never touches balls. Um, Cause it's just lower than the center line of the ball. Um, so that was probably unnecessary, but it did allow, it allows us not to track weirdly or anything. Um, if we only had a 15 millimeter belt, we would have had to print up and not have the belt skip or anything, which I don't think would have happened. But um, we did get some places where this belt tries to drive pretty low and starts marking up these pulleys. Um, and we were working on ways to increase. We may have even, like if we were in the future, we may have printed this up higher to try to avoid that um, as we were getting some resistance there um, where the belt would rub down here. Um, we did want to get rid of any, um, the weight of an extra um, planetary reduction or anything like that. So there was some talk about using a Neo 550 into an ultra planetary, um, but we still knew we, because we're doing this dead axle setup and everything, we still knew we needed a belt reduction. Um, so the, we challenged the designers to do this and get it tested in a single reduction. Um, and we were able to do that. So we used a 12th tooth, um, three millimeter pulley on the end of the Neo 550. And uh, what's the pulley count here? Anyone remember? 84. Um, so what's that? That's seven to one, right? 12 times seven. Is that yes. The yes. number? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so seven to one from that Neo 550 to our belts um, was good enough. Um, had we had a verse planetary, we probably would have gone a little bit more reduction. Um, but because you have so much torque in the Neo 550s, um, there wasn't a situation where we were worried about jamming. And most of the time, you're not trying to really use more torque to fix jams anyway, because that largely means you're shoving the ball in somewhere where you don't want it to be. Um, and you need to be reversing to try to pull the ball out of something. Um, so we didn't, we were fixing any of those types of issues. Um, and that worked well enough. We actually, it's not in the, is it in the cat on either one? Oh, it's in the cat on the other side. So um, to mount the Neo 550, um, we actually used the motor mounting plate from a Versa Planetary um, because we didn't want to have to figure out how to get into those motor bolts with the belt and like bolting in from the bottom here. We knew we needed a plate to mount to these risers. Um, so this riser, is it the exact same cat as the Neo 5 or as the Neo intake riser? Uh, yes, right. and both of those are the same cat from last year too. They were. Oh sure. wow. Okay. Um, so yeah. So we didn't. We we were. Yeah. We didn't do any new work. Um, so yeah. So this is the same riser we used on our 2019 intake. Um, so it's the same on the intake this year, and it's the same here by using that Neo by using the Versa Planetary mounting plate, which we have. Um, like this is not even like we didn't make this ourselves or anything. This is just actually one of the 550 Versa Planetary mounting plates because you get one with every Versa Planetary and we rarely used 550s in the past, right? Most of our Versa Planetaries have 775s in them. So we have dozens and dozens of these 550 mounting plates. Um, we bored the hole in it bigger. So I don't think it's shown in CAD. Um, I can't imagine we did it. But yeah, so we basically, we just drilled this hole out a little bit bigger to be able to pass the 12th tooth pulley through it. Um, so that if we needed to take it off, we can unbolt it and pull the plate, um, and still pass the pulley through without having to like, uh, try to pull the pulley off the motor or anything. Um, and we just used the plastic ones and they worked fine without having, without any real issue. Um, the bottom of this bed is actually, um, this is wood. Did we run a PTFE lining on top of it? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is um, this was six millimeter Baltic birch plywood that we laser cut, and then we had a PTFE laser cut sheet that was cut in the same pattern that was mounted on top of it, so the balls were slicker, and we weren't. Um, also, when we touched it and we're interacting with it, you're not touching the wood, which every once in a while gets you like splinters and stuff, which is annoying. Most of the time, it's not so bad. It's painted. Like you don't really, but it's still um, the plastic feels nicer than the wood most of the time. Um, and it didn't add much weight to have that really thin sheet of PTFE on top of it. Um, this whole plate is just zip tied down. So when we need to get to any of the um, electronics or the drivetrain gearboxes that are under it, um, it's just unplugging the two Neo 550s, cutting some zip ties um, and on the little shields on the side. And this whole assembly can get pulled out without pulling off the intake. Um, or anything like that. So we can pull this pretty easily um, if we need to. There's no, we didn't design in any way to like tip it anywhere. So like if we just cut the front, you can get a little bit of room by tipping it up. Um, but really if you have to work down here, you basically have to pull the whole thing out, which isn't that bad. Um, the side guards were added to prevent any balls from getting um, kind of jammed in here in the side. We still had some at Dripping Springs. Um, so we added some like zip ties crossing from these outer side walls um, to our elevator rails to try to prevent some of that. Um, we would have probably done some more um, kind of thin features up here to prevent ball jams had the season continued. Um, but largely this worked pretty well. It was built to be able to hold three balls in here while the intake is closed if they're all spaced properly. Ideally, we only ever have two. Um, so there are two here in the funnel and there are three in our tower was kind of the design goal. Okay, um, we are still doing good on time. Um, did I miss anything on intake or V funnel? I don't think so. Um, okay. So moving forward, we end up having, we going from the funnel, we go into our tower. Um, our tower is definitely one of the places that we would have probably been tweaking the most throughout the whole season had we gone um, more events as we were constantly trying to fiddle with it to prevent any ball jamming and to nicely feed our first three balls up so that we could store them cleanly before we went to fire. Um, we had it working pretty well by our first event, um, but there was definitely some tweaking we could have done in here and some redesigns to get it working a little bit better. Um, so kind of the overview of the whole structure, this was definitely a different way to build a robot than we had well, probably, I don't even know the last time we used this much one by one, right? 2012. Um, so this was different than most other seasons because we knew we kind of needed to iterate a lot on this. We were expecting to have to do a lot of different changes, remaking a bunch of plates, and we didn't want to be pulling the full structure on and off, right? Like there's, it, it would have been possible to have our shooter and our tower and everything kind of this big Lexan plate that we could have like routed or laser cut. Um, or sheet metal, like we could have done a lot of different things, but we weren't, there were so many moving parts there throughout the season that we didn't want everything tied to each other. If we needed to change something on the tower, we wanted to be able to do that without affecting the shooter, without affecting um, the mounting for like the down here path of the balls or something like that. Um, so it led to this, square tube frames that run on either side of our ball tower um, that come back at the top are mounted to the top uh, climber cross support and at the bottom they have this one by one that crosses the whole chassis. Um, this originally was um, spaced between the drive rails but we ended up moving it up to accommodate the climber gearbox, which we'll get to later. Um, 
and that worked well enough. Um, this was definitely a little tricky as we were basically laser cutting all of our, all of these side gussets. So none of these are metal. So all of these gussets are plastic. So we can do it on a laser cutter. Most of them, um, all of them Delrin on our competition robots. So they're a little bit stiffer than polycarb. They don't flex as much. Um, and then these inner panels were polycarb for some of them. I don't think any of these got to Delrin, right? I don't think any of these bigger ones did. Uh, I don't think so. Um, and so we could rivet into all of the, um, all of this was VersaFrame 0.04 wall tubing to keep it as light as possible um, and have all the pre-drilled holes for us. So originally we thought we were gonna be able to do a lot of the drilling on a router um, and we just weren't getting um, consistent holes being straight or anything like that when we tried it. Um, and ideally when we get our new CNC router coming in the fall, we'll be able to get that tuned in and be able to make our own VersaFrame. Um, but we have to, buying it is not horrible. It's just, it's definitely more expensive than doing our own uh, one by one tube. Um, oh, we ne did we never CAD this thing? I don't, we know we did at some point, right? I don't know where it is. Okay, somewhere there's a Lexan panel that sits down here um, that just gets zip tied in to this back frame and zip tied in here as well. Um, there's nothing too special on that, right? At one point it was just a random piece of Lexan because um, we actually forgot it going to Pearland one time, right? Um, so we went to go practice and we couldn't shoot balls because we had no piece of Lexan here. So the balls would just like go hit our power diffusion panel and the climber shaft. I don't think, the, I don't know if the climber was on that robot. That might've been the practice bot. Um, so we had to like grab a piece of Lexan from them and make one on site so we could get the balls funneling in relatively cleanly. Um, there was some work done here to have the balls not get jammed into these corners. So we had these at different heights before and kind of at different places and the balls could get caught kind of coming through here. Um, at one point they were even like, these were trying to be attached to these poles and things and that never really worked out. Um, this design worked well enough to not get the balls um, in any weird spots. Um, we played around a lot with whether there were wheels here. I don't even know what the final robot config is at the moment, where there, there are wheels. Are wheels. There's wheels here. I don't, I don't think they're on the back. Yeah, I don't know where they are compared to like at the tops and places. I think there's only ones on the front and they might even be different ones. Um, oh, that was one of the development parts we didn't talk about. So at one point we had um, kind of big wheels at the ends here that we thought we needed to kind of compress the balls through. Um, and that just made this whole thing more complicated um, and it tightened up and got weird and was causing issues. And it was one of those like we kind of initially we designed in more stuff that ended up causing problems than it did fixing problems. So ideally when we're designing stuff, we should try to keep it as simple as we can. And if it works, great. And then add as we go, we're here, we kind of added stuff at the beginning and had to pull away, which works too, but you can get easier if you can like be like, hey, do we really need this? Um, and actually test it first. Yeah, because they were bottom belts also, right? Oh yeah, at one point, so that's actually why this design got kind of weird. At one point, this was a belt set up from this roller down to here, and there was work to put a full belt all the way across this like middle, and there was gonna be like a channel here. Um, but trying to mount that and connect the belts, it was way more complicated. Like one of our, I think one of our ideal design situations in the future is gonna be only to have, um, as few belts on shafts as we can get, right? If there's only one belt on a shaft, it's much easier. Like even the ones powering here, these get kind of weird to install a little bit. They're relatively, they're not too bad because you just put the tops in last, but these are the powertrains for the tower, which we're gonna go over in a second. And having to get both these belts in and things um, is a little tricky. If you just pull this roller, getting it remounted without taking the top one off um, can be a bit tricky. There's enough flex in the Lexan and things that it works out. Um, okay. Um, coming up the tower, so the ball gets sucked in by this front roller. 
Um, it rolls across the Lexan, then it grabs his back and it starts getting pushed up. Um, to be able to center the balls, um, they're not, the back ones aren't in CAD at the moment. I don't know if they're just hidden. I have to go look. Um, but basically, there's four of these rails. Wait, are there? Did we take, did we get rid of the back ones? Yeah, we took the back ones out. Oh, never mind. I'm wrong. The original design had four rails. Now there are only two. So there are these two front rails that start out wider at the bottom and get narrower at the top um, to kind of center the ball as it goes up. And this kind of just prevents the balls from um, going off too far to the sides. There used to be ones back here, but they were not allowing us to use our back movable belt well, if I believe, right? They were still, anytime we had these back ones in, the front belt alone could still like pull the balls all the way up to the shooter, um, which was frustrating, right? These balls are so grippy that as long as they're contacting a moving thing at all, they kind of just move with it. Um, okay, yeah, real quick, we'll go through the powertrain. It's nothing too complicated. At one point, it was a versus planetary. We wanted to reduce some weight. So we swapped it to a Falcon with, I believe this is an eight, right? Because we wanted to get as much reduction as we could. Yes, there's a Falcon eight tooth pinion um, and driving a 30. And for some reason, this isn't 30. This is like 30, 26. I have to remember, I don't remember exactly why this happened. Um, I believe it's supposed to be 28, 28. So, but you changed it for some reason. At one point it was, and then we couldn't do that because of, oh, I remember, we didn't own them. Um, <laughs> so this was one of those ones where we designed based around what we owned at the time, and we never went back in and fixed. Um, and this is definitely on me. Um, I was playing with this when we made it, because for some reason, whoever else wasn't, I don't remember exactly why, but I was doing it. And we were working through it, and there was something that I didn't document or some problem that led to us having to do this on the final version. Um, and it's almost certainly my fault. Again, I shouldn't design robots. Um, it, they work out much better when the students do. Um, but it ended up working, but it is a little odd and probably not ideal that our front belt is going faster than our back, right? Yes. Um, Right, because our back belt is 8 to 30, and our front belt is 8 to 28, uh, or 26. Um, so the balls are spinning a little bit as they go up, which may be causing some jam issues, right? If you have two balls touching and they are trying to spin, they don't like that. Um, so that is definitely something we would fix and probably would have even fixed in season um, as we made the next iterations of our tower and things. Um, yeah, these are just laser cut plates with um, seven eighths bearings and turned down hex shafts. I think these are half inch hex shafts turned down to three eighths. Oh, yeah, they are, and turned down to three eighths at the ends. Um, and this gives us the reverse direction we need. So the front and back are spinning the opposite directions. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so one of the ways that we let the ball stack on each other, um, we do have sensors in here. There is a, ooh, where am I in there is a IR sensor down here. I want to say this very front hole is where we currently have it mounted. So it's set up to where you have like the IR sensor through this top and the zip ties go through, um, these sides and around it. So there's an IR brake beam sensor here and a receiver on the other side. And there's one up at the top as well. Um, so we do have some ways to play with it in um, programming to tell where we have balls um, a little bit. So there's one up here as well. Um, but ideally, we didn't want to be um, doing too much of a sorting algorithm. So we were trying to solve it mechanically as much as we could, um, and then doing some of it on programming, right? So get as much of the ball sorting done in the mechanical system and then just trying to tweak it and make it better with programming instead of relying fully on the programmed intake algorithm to get all of our spacing right. 
Um, so largely what we do is while we're feeding and intaking, these pneumatic cylinders here are pulling this top pulley backwards along an arc. So it's not mounted anywhere along these sides. It's pivoting down here along this um, bottom shaft. So it's, on, it's mounted on bearings here. Um, so it's able to pivot. And since we're pulling it away, basically the whole tower loses compression as we go up. Um, can I hide this in here? Uh, that mostly works. Okay, so yeah, so this gets pulled down and away. So now this gap up at the top is bigger, but the gap at the bottom is the same. So balls can kind of be pushed in, but as they go up, they slide back down because they lose compression between the two belts. Um, so the goal was to basically be able to stack three balls much closer together than you normally would, even with just ball spacing, right? You normally end up leaving kind of a gap and we were trying to fit it into a relatively short tower um, to fit three balls into. Cause we didn't want to have to like come back the other direction. We didn't want to bring this forward. We had some other stuff going on up here where we're designing in the forks and things that we'll get to a little bit later. Um, so that was the way we did that. And it worked relatively well. Um, there's a few matches at Dripping Springs. You can see where we misfired, where either a ball got pushed too high um, or even with it open, it still caught um, where somehow the shooter was running and the ball still went up and um, it still got grabbed and shot out earlier than we wanted it to. Um, I'm going to say these... Um, These top pulleys, did we ever put, I don't think we ever put bearings or bushings into these, right? These are just spinning on, these are just plastic spinning on aluminum shafts, right? I think. Yes, I believe so. Um, which is definitely a little bit janky. <laughs> um, we probably should have put bushings or bearings into here at some point. Um, and we probably would have as the season went on, but it was one of those, it's working, don't need to fight it at the moment. Um, I think somewhere else there's another one of these standoffs up here somewhere too, I think, to stop this from bowing at all. So these plates wanted to kind of bend out due to the tension of this belt. So these would kind of bend outwards a little bit, not having any um, flanges or anything else cut into here. Um, there's probably some version of this that would have been made a little bit differently to stiffen these up a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, like I said, so when we were bringing in balls, these would be pulled back. The three balls would stack up into this tower and be able to stay there without getting fed into the shooter. We also made, uh, can we see it? Well, so this part is this little like oval cutout that basically kind of prevents Ideally, the hope was that as this was down, if the ball's kind of popcorned up at all, they would have to be a little bit more centered and this would shoot it back down a little bit if they weren't, um, if the ball wasn't coming up centered, they would touch this plate first and get pushed back down into our tower, um, which did help a little bit. And this was able to be installed um, even when these plates are on. So there's a gap cut into this that this plate can be inserted from the side, press down, and then instead of having um, a slot for a nut and a bolt to go in, because we wouldn't have been able to put a bolt in from the top here because there's no room, um, we just had zip ties go around it um, and secure it into place. And that worked more than well enough for this plate, right? It's not super load bearing. Um, it only has to cap it. Um, so using the zip ties there allow us to do that without the bolt assemblies. Okay, um, did I miss anything on tower? I don't think so. Yeah, so this is all laser cut Lexan. We did have some lightning in places that wasn't super critical, but it doesn't hurt to do it. Um, there's almost certainly ways to do it without that. Um, Oh, these, oh, we didn't talk about shoulder bolts. So these are mounted, all of these shafts have 
seven eighths bearings in the plate and then there are shoulder bolts going in from the outside and these hex shafts or thunder hex shafts are tapped to five sixteenths 18 um, which is the thread for the shoulder bolt so you have a three eighths um, shoulder in this bearing um, and they're tapped into here uh, did we do the counter bore this season were all these yeah. all these shafts were counterboard and tapped, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So stemming back to a actually all the counterboard stems all the way back to a misordered shoulder bolt from the 2017 season, but we found that it actually helps, so we kept doing it. Um, basically, the shoulder is actually longer than the bearing. So to just do the bearing, you need like a 5 16th shoulder bolt, I think, right? And I think I misordered in 2017 and ordered 5 8 shoulder bolts. Um, and we've kept the 5 8 shoulder bolt that goes further past the bearing. So we'll counterboard a 3 8 the hex shaft, and then start the tap. Um, and that gets your... Um, what does that get? That gets your hex kind of getting filled with that steel shoulder there. So it's much harder to break across because you're not breaking at the shoulder tap or the thread. I don't think we've ever actually broke a shoulder bolt at the thread either. I don't think we ever would in any of our rotary applications. Um, but the counter bore isn't much more work on the lathe um, since we're doing the tapping there anyway and drilling out to the tap size and everything. Um, so it doesn't cost us much and it ends up, it makes insertion not too much more difficult or anything. You can kind of, even if you're trying to pull belt tension, you can get the threads into that counter bore hole um, and then get it fought into the actual thread and thread it in and it works relatively well. Um, there was some weirdness on this in terms of spacing because we didn't have, what did we not do? So we went from like, one of the things we do during our prototypes that's kind of frustrating that we don't have a really solid fix for is our materials change thickness slightly. All these things that we kind of categorize as quarter inch material, whether that's um, in some places, five millimeter plywood, six millimeter plywood, six millimeter polycarb, quarter inch polycarb, and quarter inch delrin all kind of get grouped together as this like quarter inch material but they're all slightly different and that definitely affects some of our shaft spacings and things. Um, so if we're not being careful, um, things get a little wonky. So, and even just, I, one of the places where it matters is up here on the tower in CAD, these flanges are on the inside, but if we do that, the whole bearing assembly can like kind of pop out of these holes. So on some of them, the bearings are flipped around and are on the outside holding everything together. And on some of them, they're on the inside. I think they're, I know they're outside, I think up here on the real one. I don't remember where the back is. Okay. Um, shooter, and then we move. Oh, uh, wait, um, uh, yeah. we, we actually changed the shoulder bolts out. We put bushings in the bearings. We didn't use shoulder bolts on the shafts on the bottom, did we? Didn't we like put bushings and like 10, 24 bolts in there? Did we do that on all of them? At least the bottom ones, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Again, these are times where I don't build the robots. Um, okay, so yeah, let's go back and talk about what we ended up changing to. So the shoulder bolts are relatively heavy. Um, not really, but heavy enough. And since we know how low load this is, right, there's not this shaft itself is not ever going to try to get sheared off here. Um, we ended up going back in changing these shafts to instead of being tapped to, instead of being counterboarding tapped to 5816, just tapping them to quarter, right? Uh, I th think so. Yes. Because they have to be, yeah. right? Because otherwise, yeah, and then we have a bushing that is three eighths ID quarter OD inside this bearing. Yeah. 
right? Um, so inside the ID of the bearing, which is three eighths, there's a bushing that's just acting as a reducer um, that goes from that three eighths ID to a quarter inch ID. And then there's just a quarter inch bolt going through it. So we're able to spin, um, we're able to just kind of clamp this bearing up to the, clamp the shaft up to the bearing with that quarter inch bolt and everything's spinning on the three eighths bearing nicely. Um, but we get a little bit lighter since we just have that bronze bushing and a quarter 20 bolt than the full three eight shoulder, um, three eight shoulder bolt. Thank you, Felipe. I completely forgot we did that. Um, those are just some places where we're trying to get some minor weight savings. Um, there were definitely probably other places we could have got weight savings had we been designing the robot from the start kind of right. But we were going back in and trying to shave weight. Um, and that's one of the places where we knew we could do it. Um, okay. Um, moving up to the shooter, we get into some funkiness in some of these places. So let's see, let's get overview of the shooter. Maybe Cad wants to play nicely. Um, Transparent. Okay. So, uh, do I need all of? Uh, you can still see what's happening. Okay. So, we went through a bunch of different shooter um, kind of prototypes and things we were playing with. We didn't probably prototype as much as I would have liked certain concepts of the shooter to get as far out as we wanted to, because one of the things we knew kind of intrinsically was that we wanted a longer acceleration path for the balls to get a more consistent exit velocity. That was kind of the thought. Um, and as we were doing that early on, one of the ways we did that was with a four inch accelerator wheel and a six inch shooter wheel. Um, Part of the thoughts of this is we weren't sure if we were going to have them powered separately or powered by the same couple motors. So by having the two different diameters, it was relatively easy to get two different um, surface speeds because we could run them, we could run the two shafts at the same RPM, but have this bottom shaft have a smaller surface speed since it's a smaller diameter wheel. So that means it has more torque. So as the ball, which is moving very slowly when it touches that, it's able to do the initial acceleration a little bit better than the six inch wheel can, since it has a larger surface speed and lower torque at the, um, at the point of contact with the ball. Um, so that's kind of the first setup we played with. And we really didn't go away from that, right? We, started playing with that on our kind of early prototype towers um, and never really looked at other options of like, maybe we have a bunch more rollers, right? Maybe two isn't enough. Maybe we have two two inch rollers, right? We didn't really play with um, other choices all that much as we probably should have done, right? There's probably a little bit more due diligence we could have done there to see how it affected things. Um, I think we would have had we beaten up balls more early in the season. Cause even the, even the balls that we kind of considered bad in our first couple weeks of prototype shooting were nowhere close to how bad they got beaten up during competition. Um, we were way gentler, like even though they had some punctures and some holes, um, they were still pretty reliable balls compared to what we were actually seeing at some of the competition, especially by the end of competition um, and what everybody else saw as they were competing as well. Um, so the shooter concept definitely worked. It was, it's probably not optimized, right? There's definitely some things we could do if we were doing this development over a much longer time, we could optimize this further. Um, this bottom four inch wheels are Andy Mark stealth wheels. Um, they're relatively flat. They grip the ball well. Um, didn't have any issues with them, and they're very light. Um, 
which here we weren't as worried about getting a lot of mass on our accelerator wheels um, as we were getting the final velocity right with the shooter wheels. Whether that's the right answer or not, I don't know. There may be some case for having a little bit more mass here. Um, but they worked well enough. Back here is probably one of the things we've tested the least. Um, this was relatively late, right? We added this back roller as we were kind of trying to figure out how to do the hood as the compression cycle gets kind of awkward going to this four inch wheel at the front here. Um, we didn't really know what we wanted to be opposite this. You don't really want to like make some weird thing that kind of bulges back out weirdly to compress here. Um, and we didn't really like a lot of our options. So we were like, okay, if it's spinning, that probably helps a little bit compared to trying to just compress it over a um, non-moving tube or another flat plate or something. Um, so we're like, okay, let's put some small wheels back here. What can you package? The two inch stealth wheels worked packaged well enough and we could drive it off a crossed polycord belt. Um, so this is the only place that has polycord on the robot. Um, these are the West Coast products pulleys. I don't remember if we ran, I know we own some of the actual ones, but I think we might have run printed ones. Um, they worked well enough. Um, and that let us have this back wheel rotating counter to the front accelerator wheel. Um, that was a little bit tricky as we ended up having to mount that we didn't have a lot of choices on spacing as we were basically mounting it dead center through this tube to be able to get the bearing in place in this rail and get a bolt going through it nicely. So in the real robot, one of these holes is drilled out um, so we can stick a quarter 20 bolt through and bolt in. So this does the bushing trick too, I'm pretty sure. So there's a quarter inch ID bushing in this bearing here and a quarter 20 bolt is holding this back shaft in place. Um, the shooter motors up at the front, we are doing a is 1.5, right? Something like that. 36 to 18, I think, maybe not. No, 36 to 24, sorry, 1.5, yeah, 36 to 24. Um, so we're getting a um, – we're making the top speed of our shooter wheel potentially way faster, right? If we ran these motors full bore, these would be spinning up towards – what is that like up towards 9,000 RPM, right? If the Falcon's spinning at, what's the Falcon spinning at? 6,300, whatever it's spinning at, something like that. Um, so if we were running this full bore, these would be going at like 9,000 RPM. That was never the ideal. That was never what we were planning to do, but we knew we needed to spin the six inch wheel. This is all from memory, somewhere closer to 5,000 to 6,000 RPM especially for like a really deep shot. If we were trying to shoot from like behind the DJ, um, behind the color wheel um, control panel, um, which originally in season, that was one of our largest goals was to be able to have a shot from beyond half court. Um, due to ball territory, uh, due to the ball wear and ball inconsistencies, we never got a consistent shot from there. And we never even tried it in competition because we didn't need it. Is um, some of it because we had Neos on it at one point and then we wanted to keep the speed. Um, so even Neo or Falcon, either way, you need some amount of up reduction, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be 1.5 to 1. It could have been lower, but you want to be running – our goal is to be running our ideal shooter speed midway through um, the power band of the Falcon. So we actually wanted our ideal shooter speed to be around half of whatever our top speed was so that when we're running there and we're telling the Falcon to run at that point – it has the most power to get to do recovery, right? So um, as the balls are pulling through, the wheel's trying to spin at, let's call it 4,500 RPM. 
when the ball comes through and starts slowing down the wheel as it's adding the resistance, the motors can generate as, the, as much power as they need to hit that 45,000 RPM mark, right? If we try, if we tried to shoot at 9,000 and we're completely saturated, um, as soon as a ball comes in, there's no way the motor can add any more power to get it to, to get it to stay at 9,000, right? It's already running at full voltage. Um, so by making our motors run efficiently when they're just free spinning, right, they get a lot of power to spin up. Um, so they get up to speed very, very quickly because we're asking them to go to a speed that's in the middle of their power band. Um, and they can, they have enough overhead power um, to stay there while the ball is coming through um, and it's trying to slow it down. So the motors are able to react, add more power to it and basically tell it to, hey, we're, we're slowing down all the, the PID, the control loop is doing all that. Um, and is increasing the power as the ball's coming through and uh, as once that ball is fired and the wheel is now unloaded, the motor is able to get it back up to the same speed as fast as possible. Um, so we weren't putting large flywheels anywhere on the robot. Um, the two Colsons up here have enough mass for us with our two Falcons to maintain a pretty good RPM range as we're firing through all those balls. So we could sit there and graph the RPMs of the shooter wheel as the balls were exiting. Um, and they weren't perfect by any means. There was some tuning we were gonna try to do throughout the season, um, but they were pretty good. Um, it was, in a, it was a relatively small band of RPMs. The wheel was staying pretty consistent throughout the entire shot because it had enough power um, and because the wheels gave it enough mass and inertia to um, not lose some of that energy as the balls were flying through. Um, I think there was definitely some stuff we could have done to the accelerator wheels to keep them going up at the right speed. Um, I don't think we did as much work trying to tune these as we probably could have. That would have probably been further in the season. We probably would have tuned down here a lot more. Um, oh, so some little fun thing. So to actually be able to make these pulleys, these are 3D printed. Um, they have the inverse of a 10 tooth pinion, I believe. Um, yeah, there's a 10 tooth um, shaft for these. So these are built and they kind of like went through and funneled them a little, or uh, chamfered them inside here. So there's some piloting. So we basically take a 10 tooth Falcon pulley or pinion and press it on to this 3D printed part. Um, and that worked very, very well for getting us um, a shaft adapter to this Falcon spline that wouldn't skip, right? So some teams just printed the Falcon spline directly. Um, and while that very well likely could have worked um, and did for some teams, the chance of failure and where we were in our development cycle just didn't seem worth it to not spend the whatever $10 per pulley um, per motor to press an opinion um, and know that there's no way that we're ripping out all of this plastic where the actual tooth is, um, right? So we're basically just using that pinion gear as a spline for this outer pulley. Um, and then I think all of these were actually aluminum 18 tooth VEX half inch pulleys, I believe. I don't think we ran printed on any of our comp stuff. Um, I do not remember the belt spacing here, but somewhere we have that documented. Um, they're just relatively small. Um, belt from V belt guys where almost every one of our all of our timing belts come from V belt guys for the most part um, or they're like old stock that we had from either Vex or China or somewhere else. I have no idea what that is that's just a random floating pulley that doesn't exist. Okay um, yeah so that's the shooter powertrain the hood is the next part which we also ended up doing well late. So our initial prototypes had a lot of flex in them that were causing issues. Um, so I don't think we started getting consistent shots with our hood till what, like almost middle of week five, week six, somewhere. It was pretty late when we made the 3D printed stiff hood finally. Um, 
this was because we already had built in these rails and kind of where we needed the mounting points for all of this got kind of a frustrating because you had to like get them through these tubes and things that we didn't really want. Like we were kind of locked in on some of these spacings. Um, these could all shift. Like I don't know if these are actually centered. I think these are, these can be moved back and forth. We could also move the shooter wheels themselves forward and backwards to change our compression. Um, but ideally we probably would have done this a little bit different to be able to swap the hood easier. Um, right now it definitely takes several people quite a lot of time to do a hood swap. Um, because there's just a bunch of threaded rods going through multiple spacers out here on these ends so that we didn't have to print a super wide, a super long part. Um, it's possible by the end of it, we were just doing that and printing the full gap um, to make it easier. Um, because right now you have like these Lexan parts on the outside, you have these 3D printed part, and you have these little seven, eight spacers with 3D printed parts on the inside, like the part count just got really large as we were building this up. Um, so I would not do that the same way again if we ever um, did it. None of the spacers are shown in here. Um, this was, what, three different parts, right? So you have this top section, um, which was 3D printed vertically, right? So it's sitting on the bed this way and coming up. So we could change, um, what was I gonna say? We could change this exit angle a little bit if we wanted to. Um, with the way it's built, you could change it to go forward a little bit if we wanted to like print one of these and have it extend out, but that's only, but this was flat, so it was a little odd, right? So the curvature runs through these three portions, and then this portion's actually flat, and it kind of sets the angle. So to actually change angle, you had to go in and kind of change all of these, like change the rails and everything else, um, which was not ideal by any means either. Um, so ideally, we would have figured out something that let us change and modify this more. Um, we kind of found something that worked and just kind of went with it and tuned it out in velocity. Um, but ideally, had we done this again and made a fix to it, we would have had something that we could have iterated a little bit faster and got real results from. Um, it wasn't as nice as we had planned. Um, okay. Um, did I miss anything on Shooter, we at some point we designed in places to be able to put multiple motors. So we weren't sure exactly what configuration we were gonna run or where the motors needed to be. So there's like spots for six Falcons to mount up here. We were never even considering any more than four probably. We weren't sure if we were gonna have like two on the accelerator wheel and two on the top or three on the top wheel if we needed it. Um, this two and one worked well enough for our first event. We weren't having, from shooting where we ended up shooting and playing the game for Dripping Springs that we were fine. Um, but throughout the season, we may have changed things and leaving them there didn't hurt anything. It added some laser time, didn't really affect anything else. Um, I think these were actual shoulder bolts, right? I don't think we did the quarter 20 things up here. Um, no, that was a, that's a lot of RPM for that. Yeah, um, shoulder bolts and like lock Loctite. tight um, to make sure those aren't coming out anywhere where we have these blind threaded holes and we don't have lock nuts, we get some version of Loctite or Vibratite or whatever you want to use on there. Um, some form of thread locker. Um, okay, did I miss any shooter assembly stuff? I don't think so. So this front plate was there to be able to mount our camera assembly. Um, so that was a limelight. We still run V1s. We bought them back in it. We bought one or two back in 2018. And then we acquired a couple more through different means. So we actually haven't spent that much money on limelights. I think we've only spent, what we spent like $900, $1,000 or something on like the four limelights that we own. Uh, <laughs> I think we bought one from the poofs and we got one somehow else that, I think one of them's like slightly broken, like the fan doesn't work, but it still sort of works. Um, so I think we got a replacement sent to us by limelight because they were just, really nice because their service is awesome. Um, 
Um, so yeah, we've stayed V1. We might move to V2 at some point, but the V1s do everything we've needed so far and we haven't had an issue with them. Um, and then we made this little 3D printed mount to mount our wide angle camera um, that we actually didn't, we didn't run, right? No, because we could only have one. Yeah, because for Dripping Springs, we didn't run the other camera server at all. We were only running the limelight. So we had our rear camera mount, which is not in CAD. Nope. Um, so somewhere in, oh, yes, is it, no, it's not. No, it's mounted to the crossbar of the climber at the top. Oh, yeah, it's mounted way up here. You are correct. Um, yeah, so way up here, there is a camera mount that comes down off a plate down here and it's pointed down to the hole um, to be able to see the intake um, and the V funnel and everything. Um, we have a nice view of the whole back of the robot as we're driving around. So all of our intaking and things, we can work off of that camera. And then for shooting, most of it's all computer aided anyway, where the limelight's doing our aiming. Um, but we do use the limelight feed itself to know that we can like have the target in view and we can hit the auto aim button and everything. Um, from the front side. So we don't actually have a um, view of the front other than whatever is retroflecting off the limelight at the time. So we get whatever the retroflective tape and any like field lights and stuff, we'll get through that image, but that's about it. Cause we're not changing the settings or contrast or anything to give us a normal image. It's always the darked out limelight image that's just looking for the vision targets. Um, I think what else is up here? Yeah, there's some holes for like wire management because all of these, all the shooter wires and anything else from up here are running down along these cross members um, and getting wired in all the way down to the bottom where the PDP is. Um, we didn't really talk about electrical mounting. Most of it is on the belly pan. Now that we have um, Falcons, we reduced some of our speed controller mounting locations because they have them integrated in the back. Um, Battery mount is simple. It's just um, Deller and plate with a couple standoffs and a place for the battery strap to run through. Um, nothing too complicated onto our belly pan. Few places for spark max for like the elevator and the spark max up here for the intake and the V funnel, the indexer. Um, where the Robo Rio went was one of our kind of bigger kind of decision points as we didn't really want to block our power diffusion panel, um, but we wanted the convenience of having the Robo Rio flat so we could put the, we were running the analog devices um, first choice uh, gyroscope in here. Um, so leaving it flat was easier so we weren't having to switch which unit we were using if we tried to mount it up on one of our side panels over here. Um, so we ended up making this kind of standoff plate, this blue plate that um, is mounted on standoffs from the Robo Rio or from the power diffusion panel and gives us a place to zip tie in the Robo Rio. Um, and then when we need to look at the breakers, you can just cut a couple of the zip ties and flip up the Robo Rio to see all the breakers underneath it. Um, where is off the side panel? I can unhide this other one. So yeah, our other control side panel, some of the things we do on every robot, we have our power strip or power switch, the main breaker recessed behind a panel with a cutout. So it's always mounted on standoffs. So there's no way for a ball to come in and hit our power switch. There's no way for basically anything other than a hand to come in and hit our power switch, but it's very easy to get to with your hand to turn it on and off. Um, above it is a cutout for a voltage display that we never put in CAD. We just always cut the rectangle for it. Um, so this is just always mounted right into the same power path as our custom circuits. So what's powering the limelight, what's powering our, um, there's a switch on this robot this year, I think, right? Did we run a switch? Yes, we had to. So there's a switch running. Um, there's radio mounting, which I think it's closer to the top, right? Yeah, so the radio is up here. And it's actually recessed behind this panel too. So that little cutout is for the lights. So we all get zip tied behind that panel. And then all these holes are just places that we can wire, that we can run zip ties for all the wire management running down it. Um, I think there's like a, there's a voltage adapter in here somewhere. Um, this side has a USB 
um, extension port for the RoboRio. Um, I don't know what some of these other things are. There's like holes in some places where I'm not sure what they were for. Um, okay, yeah, and the other side is pneumatics. So we have our, um, there's like five air tanks that can be mounted over, or four air tanks that can be mounted on that side. Um, and then regulator and gauge um, down here. Um, and relief valve. Oh no, I have, no, the relief valve is some crazy place. We forgot about it, right? Uh, it's under the V. Yeah, because the front of the pneumatics is the compressor and everything is all the way over here. And we were getting inspected at Dripping Springs when I remembered that we had never mounted a blow off valve, relief valve. Um, so we added that while Jack was talking to the inspector about something else. <laughs> so I, I think that was James and I as we went through and we're like, oh, we should probably do this as our robot is very illegal right now. Uh, which I'm not sure what we were doing prior to that. I think we we're just like not blowing off air at any point or like unplugging a tube if we had to. Um, it's probably not good. We probably should have figured that out ahead of time. Um, but it worked well enough and we, we got it done and passed inspection without, I don't even think the inspector knew what we were doing, but we fixed it. Um, okay. Um, did I miss anything other than what we're going to go in and start talking about climber? Um, okay. So let's, I don't want to do climber cleanly. So let's do climber itself and then we'll do gearbox and then we'll talk about the forks. That makes sense. I think that makes sense. Okay. So Big picture overview of our climber was that the the plan from kind of like the moving plan after the kind of initial design discussions after kickoff that first week or so was that we wanted to be able to do a buddy climb because we were worried that we'd get left behind in like the qualifying race if you get a match where your partners can't climb um, but you can easily win the match you're missing that ranking point. Um, and we've known in the past that missing that ranking point hurts us and we're not ranking one. And then we're left to kind of this draw situation of like, can we actually get picked by the team we want to get picked by? Can we form a good alliance as not being the captain? It's worked out for us in the past in times. It's been in rough at other times. Um, so trying to hit for that one, that number one seed was kind of part of our goal pushing forward this year. Um, we didn't realize how difficult that was going to be, right? We had a system that we thought worked relatively well. Several other teams were running similar concepts or kind of designing similar concepts. We knew we weren't down a road alone. There were other teams doing a similar thing. Um, we just didn't realize how annoying it was going to be to get another team under you and pick them up. Um, <laughs> As other, there are a few videos of teams trying it and just it never really working well. Um, so because of that, our climber needed to do, had some requirements on it that weren't actually needed once we decided to no longer do the buddy climb. Um, one of those being that this whole section of robot had to be empty because when we went to climb with a partner, our latches were gonna be mounted on this bar so that when we drove up and grabbed, we were basically gonna be able to pull our robot all the way up to where this section of the robot was gonna be above the hanging bar, right? The hanging bar was gonna be kind of pushed right through here. Um, all of this was gonna be able to kind of like get out of the way and lean a little bit. Um, and we were gonna be able to drop forks down from the front here and have a robot drive in and sit under us and us pick them up a little bit higher as well. That was the concept we were running with. Um, so that meant a bunch of things up here couldn't have stuff here. Um, it also meant our elevator needed to be pretty stout um, to hold not only our robot, but another potentially 120, 150 pound robot below us. Um, we started on the initial concept that was similar to our elevator last year and taking inspiration from 148's elevator from 2019 as well, um, where they just use these 3D printed blocks um, to give them a uh, 
the side bearings and these uh, four or these forward back bearings, whatever you want to call them. Um, initially, we were building it in a normal elevator configuration where this rail would have had the side bearings go the other way. And as you get up, your two bearing surfaces kind of get closer together. Um, and the whole thing's only supported by those four sets of bearings, right? The two top ones and the two bottom ones on the inside. That's how our elevator in 2019 worked. Um, that's how most elevators work. And they work fine. Um, but they led to some issues with um, some places with how we were gonna mount some things. So we knew we needed to be able to put in, um, we knew there was possibilities that we needed to mount to this rail in places and the only, if you have uh, bearings running up here, you basically can only mount to the back side of this rail. Um, you can't mount to the sides at all since the bearings running across it. Um, and so we were worried about that and we didn't want to do that. So we looked at and got some inspiration from some of the teams in 2019 who built an elevator that could go down and help be part of their level three climb. I wanna say 319 was one of those. Um, there are a few other teams who did a similar thing where they basically ran multiple sets of bearings like we see here up this one side rail. Um, and this inner rail is just going in and out of them as it runs up and down. Um, so this means if we do need to, if we need to put anything here, if we need to bolt to anywhere along the side, you totally can now. You can zip tie, you can do whatever you want as you don't have any bearings running up and down this, right? You only have bearings running up and down this space. Um, the climber had to be, it had to be spaced apart so that the balls could go under it. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we built it sheet metal because we were, we knew that there may have been times where we wanted like even like some weird cross members coming in here if we needed to stiffen it more and we weren't sure exactly what it was all going to be built as. Um, so the sheet metal rails made sense at the time. There's probably versions of this that get a lot lighter and easier if we had just done it as two by one. Um, but with two by one, you're limited on how you can mount to that side rail again with your with the bearings running across it and everything. Um, so because of that, we were a little worried of um, some of our bearing placements and things just not getting exactly what we wanted. So we just did it out of sheet metal. It worked well enough. It was heavier than it probably should have been. Um, especially once we got rid of the buddy climb, you just don't need it to be nearly as stout as this version is. Um, once we knew we weren't doing the buddy climb, we changed off of having these like gate latch type things that would have latched us to the bar um, down here and let some play. They were kind of like these v, like these funnels that when we drove in, um, they would have latched us made out of polycarb that were mounted down here to having um, some higher latches that were easier to, um, that were easier to hook on. We had a lot more height that we could reach. So we could reach really tall once the hooks were up here. Um, we still got more than enough off the ground. Um, Let's see what else. So these are aluminum plates with a 3D printed part on the inside um, and then an aluminum plate. I think our, the initial, the version we actually ran at Dripping Springs, what was it? It was only like eighth inch plate or uh, even 0 0.09 eight, plate. 0 0.09 plate with standoff right? spacers. Yeah, because we didn't even, I think, part, I don't even think we got to the point of 3D printing. I think the 3D No, we didn't. Being, yeah, the 3D prints we printed right after dripping printing, we never got fully in there. Um, and that caused all sorts of issues as we started bending those 0.09 plates a lot. Um, so the next plan was to make these thicker and uh, have a 3D print reinforcement so it's harder to bend. Um, let's see, the latch design here, which allows the pole to come in, and then this gets pulled, this gets pushed up as the pole's coming in. Once it clears its kind of center diameter, this latch snaps shut. Um, so if the bar moves or anything, the robot stays in relation to the bar. Um, this design is based off of, um, I'm gonna say the right team number, or the sorry, right team name, Mechanical Advantage. Um, whose team number I'm also blanking on at the moment. What's Mechanical Advantage? What is it, Ethan? 6328. 6328. Okay. Uh, dyslexia was going to have me swapping threes and twos and things, and that was not going to be fun. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, 6328, um, one of the Open Alliance teams published this and it was a really cool latch design. It's super light, easy to make. Um, so we ran that for Dripping Springs and it worked very well. Um, and that got us there. One of the weirdest parts, oh, before we get to there, this assembly is interesting. Um, Jack, you came up with parts of this, right? Or we ended up doing parts of this with the dowel uh, going through here? Oh, yeah. Um, so this is where a place where it differs on 148. So 148 didn't have their top bearings nearly as tall as we did because we were trying to make sure we could get as much support up there and as much uh, gaps between our bearings as we could when we were fully extended. So to bring these up to the top, to do that, you can't just put a bolt going through here to hold these internal bearings in. Um, so the way this actually works is there's a quarter inch dowel that gets pressed in, that goes through both of these bearings, and then the bolts to hold these outer bearings on, these quarter 20 bolts, stop that dowel from being able to slide around on the inside. Um, so that makes this bearing block super compact and gets these bearings a little closer to the top of our assembly. Um, okay, the next weird thing. So one of the things that we just like kind of like left to the end and did, we're like, ah, it's fine. This sprocket will be mounted up here somewhere. Um, I'm pretty sure this was just floating in space for like a good four weeks or so, right? Like it was a while um, yeah. <laughs> where this was just floating and we we're like, it'll be fine. We'll do that later. It'll be fine. We'll do that later. And we just like kept putting it off. And we were like, we finally got to like trying to be like, hey, we need to build this climber. We we're like, hmm, how in the world is there a shaft supporting this sprocket up here? I don't know how that works. Um, so we were eventually able to get a large gusset here so that this 3 8 bearing doesn't stick out the back of it. Because if it did, it would hit this tube. Um, all right, that would be bad. So you have a 3 8 bearing there. And then the issue is if you do what we would normally do and put a bearing with the flange on the inside here, there's no real way to take this apart ever <laughs> um, without like taking off this entire side plate, which we really didn't want to do. The side plate's holding these like vertical, these, uh, these supports for the side panels and kind of for the whole structure, these come down um, and stop the climber from getting pulled away from the robot too much. Um, there are also threaded rods running through this entire bar um, that are clamped shut. So you really don't want to be taking this plate off. So like, okay, how do we do this? So we eventually settled on was putting the bearing in from the outside with the flange on the outside and then riveting in um, were these rivets? They might have been bolts at one point. I don't know. Uh, they, they were rivets, and then we popped them. And then we popped them? Uh, the bearing came out. And then we put bolts in with washers, right? I think is yeah. What yeah, so I think at some point, yeah, the rivets got weird. So we put bolts through with washers, and there's nuts on the back backside. Um, and that worked well enough to hold the bearing in. Um, so then if you need to make to work on this, you can either drill out the rivets or take the bolts out, which is eventually what we had, pull this bearing, and then the whole shaft can come out this end, and you can pull this sprocket if you need to. Um, so then this bearing is just held in by this shaft. Um, we may have riveted it in a couple spots just so it didn't fall out if we were taking everything apart. I don't remember. Um, but that gets it in there nice and compact into this little opening that exists for it, right? It's annoyingly close to this tube it's annoyingly close to a lot of things um but it worked it didn't hit anything so it's fine um the power chain for this elevator is it's on both sides so we knew we wanted a very even lift um and we knew we couldn't go through the middle because we have that ball path down there um so we have um we have it running up and down both sides um it's the same chain setup that we ran in 2019 so there's a turnbuckle um, tensioner um, up at the top here when we're fully down and the whole assembly is bolted to the sheet metal frame down here really far at the bottom okay let's see yeah I can kind of show it yeah so there's bolts going through the chain to here um, now, so instead of last year where everything was sideways and we were kind of clamping and 
uh, we had these little clamp plates and then we clamped the whole chain because the whole assembly was running sideways. These are running, um, the chain's running perpendicular to the lift. So it's easier to just put the bolt straight through it um, and bolt to the sheet metal piece. So that's done on both sides. And then we get to how we're actually powering it. Um, Jack, feel free to come in and interrupt me at any point if I say something wrong, because I don't, oh, I only sort of know how this works, because um, I did not, I was kind of just letting you run with this. I can, uh, I can screen share it if you want. You want to do it? Okay, yeah, you can, you can take over, because I was only, I was like, make it work, and it started working, so I didn't, I didn't bug you about it. Um, okay, I have the elevator gearbox. Okay, here's the climber gearbox. So because we were trying to lift 300 pounds plus, uh, we needed a lot of reduction. So we have, leave three stages of reduction in here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but another problem we had was packaging because below, like right here below this gear was supposed to be a fork. So we couldn't go below, and then the shooter is right above this also. So it's very difficult to actually package all of this. So that's why it's kind of shaped weird and has gears going up and down throughout yeah. it. So yeah, the requirements on this changed a lot because originally in our head, which was poor, uh, kind of go out to the wide view, um, the... Um, the gearbox was going to be in the center of that shaft was kind of the thought was it was going to be mounted to the belly pan at some point. That was kind of the thought. Um, and we realized coming through that, that was just a bad idea, right? You're putting all this load through this wooden belly pan that's not supported on the sides. That just doesn't really work. Like we kind of just didn't quite think some of that stuff through at the very beginning. Um, we moved to the side mounting relatively early. We just didn't have it all figured out for packaging until pretty late. Um, so it all mounts to the side rail, which is much stronger um, part of the robot. Yeah, it uh, so it uses two neos and then a lot of gearing in it, and then uh, at the final stage, it's a hex shaft going. Let me highlight this hex shaft from here, from out here to here. And then there's a coupler that attaches it to the other side, which is a different hex shaft, which uh, allows us to separate it and take it out. Because if this was all one part, one hex shaft, it would be nearly impossible to take out the gearbox ever. Right, because that hex shaft it. is running completely from inside drive rail all the way to the other inside drive rail. Um, yeah, and the shooter is directly above it, so it would be impossible. And I believe. Are those the only two half-inch hex bearings on this robot? Yes, there's one here there's one on the and other one side. on the other side. I think there's only two half-inch hex bearings on the entire Yeah, row. and then the outsides are turned down. The three-eighths, yeah. Three-eighths. Um, where this gets interesting is because we were holding 300 pounds, we didn't want to leave the weight on the motor. On Yeah, so, just the Neo brake, on like brake mode. So we designed a uh, pneumatic brake. So basically, it's similar to how we did the shooter pinions. Uh, it, this is a Delrin part that's just laser cut and then pressed onto the pinion. And then it has these spokes for, a, for this pneumatic cylinder to press into, which will break all of it. And we wanted this as far up in our gearing as possible. So we get as much force on it as we can. Right, so trying to grab and stop that pinion from moving, you need a lot less force than if you're trying to stop that hex shaft at the front from moving, right? Because yeah. you're getting any force that you put down at that pinion is getting amplified. Any torque that you're putting it like there is getting amplified by all your gear reduction going up to that hex shaft. Um, so it's a lot easier to stop it back there um, than anywhere else along the chain, right? So we had we had run through some concepts of using, like West Coast Products came out with a brake. Um, so there were some concepts of being able to mount a brake into, I think that hex shaft, right? I think even both of those, yeah. like 
right? Like those holes are there to potentially use a West Coast products break somewhere if we needed to in the season. Uh, I think we, no, at that point we had to abandon that because there was an alternative to this break that was just a VP ratchet break. That was oh, like last year. That's what it was. You're right. You're right. You're right. It was, was going to mount yes. Except this time there would be no motor in the VP. Correct. Yes, that is right. Okay, you are correct. Yeah, we had abandoned the other break because yeah, we couldn't get it as well. I think it was sold out. There's some other issues with it that got weird, and we weren't sure if it was going to even hold as well because it's just like the friction break and it isn't as much of a full like lock, right? Because really, this is not even a break. This is just a pin, right? It you would not really want to be going very fast and engage this. That would be very bad. Um, where once you're relatively stationary and you engage it, it's going to lock in and just kind of engage and pin the whole drivetrain. Yeah, um, but this brake was actually never engaged. That is true. Yeah. I don't even know if we ever even tested it. It was uh, never tested. It's yeah, not we never tested. put air into that cylinder. That was all a future problem. Once we realized that we were not buddy climbing, we could the Neos in brake mode held the robot up totally fine at the end of the match, um, and we never even used it. So we did a lot of design work on it. Didn't end up using it. Would have pulled it at some point. I think it's it's actually mounted on the robot, right? We just never ran it. Yes, it's mounted. Um, both those plates, all of that is just Delrin, so that a whole assembly is Delrin. Um, oh, you want to look at how that top plate's mounted because we had to use the uh, the yeah. four three three seven Keystone brackets. Yeah. yeah. So here we would have used slots and T slots for bolts, but there's a motor here, so we couldn't. So we had to use right angle brackets here and here and on the other side you can't put the nuts either because it's up against the drive yeah train. It, it's up against the drivetrain so on the other side it is it just extends and this the bottom of this plate rests on the top of the side rail yeah. so there was actually something on there yeah there was one other thing that is true uh and then yeah but for this one you have to bolt straight into the neo because there's not enough space for anything else. Because the uh, two or the one by one for the shooter tower thing is basically, mm, it's less than an it's like right quarter there. of an inch. It's right there. Yeah, we can, go, we can go back to the whole thing in a second. We went to barely, there's not very much tolerance between it. Um, but this side is easier. Uh, yeah, that's basically the climber gearbox. There's some tight tolerances here <laughs> between that gear and that spacer. I mean, clearance is clearance, right? Like it doesn't it doesn't hit. And if it does hit, that spacer just becomes a smaller spacer <laughs> over time. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, okay. Um, if you want to exit and share, we can talk the last what was I gonna do? I'm gonna pull mine back up real fast. Yeah, so we can see where that's fully mounted. So that's um, that whole assembly is down in here. And like you said, that is incredibly close to the point where like that's overlapping in CAD. I don't exactly know what we did there. I'm assuming we got rid of something um, <laughs> because it clearly is actually mounted, but I'm not sure how. Um, we probably just cut a corner or something on that gusset. Um, Okay, so I think that covers most of the robot outside of how the forks deploy. Um, Kathleen, how do you want to do that? Do you want me to just have them open and we can walk through it on my screen, or do you want to do it on yours? So um, my SolidWorks isn't opening anything right now, so I have them open in GrabCAD, but if you just want to open them on your screen, that might be better. Yeah, it's probably easier if I just pull it here, if I can remember where they are. There they are. They're broken at the moment, but that's fine. Um, so we don't have, I don't know where the actual... I think it's hidden because in the one that I opened on GrabCAD, everything's in it and it's like, it's fine. Yeah, if you just go to show hidden components, you can probably find it. Where's show hidden components? What am I missing? At the top. On the... Next to move components. What am I doing? Right below, like the file new. Oh, you want there? A little over. Wait, no, not that. <laughs> it's just like show hidden. Show hidden components to the right of that. You see it? 
farther right. To the right. Oh, I don't hey, know there why we go. that button existed. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, okay. Our, uh, oh my god! Let's never show hitting ever again on any of our. Just... Oh my goodness! <laughs> well, that's all the other stuff that's in on our robot. What we is... just hide and don't talk about. So that's <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> what? fixing it for POV for the camera. That is to fill the view of the wide-angle lens camera, <laughs> but also, yeah, we so just... terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, fun. I also forgot a button existing cat. Cool. Okay, so yeah, there are forks. Um, there were other... Uh, yeah, somewhere down there. Some of these are kind of weird. These are like drawn as like one part and stuff, so it's a little awkward. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we can talk about what we were doing here. Okay. So yeah, so the rough idea, kind of the big overview, was that we wanted to drive... Uh, this whole assembly would be up at the top. I don't think it moves at the moment, that's fine. This whole assembly would be up and stowed. Um, there were rails that came all the way across um, the bottom from here, basically all the way to the other end of this belly pan. Another one over there. So as we deployed it, um, we would be climbing. This would touch the ground and kind of hold us straight. A robot would be able to drive into here and then we would climb up a little bit higher um, to pull us and the robot off the ground. So this fork assembly didn't have to do anything other than drop itself all the way down and be able to hold another robot in tension, right? We weren't actually using it to lift another robot at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Kathleen, if you want to describe what's happening. Yeah, so um, like early on when we had first um, decided to do a buddy climb, we were thinking of just doing a simple latch mechanism and so when the forks would actually be up in the belly pan, they would just be held by two latches on both sides. And then a pneumatic would push the latch down and the forks would just drop once we were climbed. And then soon we realized there were better ways to do this. And so we kind of modeled this after 971's, I think 2019 climber. That's correct. Because they um, used forks to push themselves up onto HAB3 and then they could pull the forks up and drive on. But um, we mainly used their their belt system and so we originally did these with versa planetaries and then we switched to a neo 550 and so there's a 54 tooth gear and then it's running to an 18 tooth pulley with the whole belt system yeah yeah so we were using the new dp like the six tooth uh gear yeah. down here so nice and tiny it actually these that gear is awesome because it fits through the neo 550 um pilot which is really cool um, um which is the first time we ever did any of those and then yeah so like she said there's a big gear here and then this pulley is running a belt that is i don't think we ever we never catted the belt did we i don't think so we never catted the belt we did cad the clamps um like a lot of stuff is hit. Fine. There were clamps at the top and bottom, and they basically just press fit the belt at the top and bottom, and then we were going to screw in the clamps. I don't know if it only shows isolated hitting components or not. I've never. Like half of the forks is isolated, but it's okay. They get the idea. Uh... Oh, it just showed everything because everything was hidden. <laughs> Apparently that's how isolate works. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks, all it works. Not, not useful. Okay, um, either way, we're, we're fine for now. So, yeah, do you want to explain some of what the bearings were doing and how that kind of worked? Yeah, sure. Um, so, the belt um, ran along the forks, and then it kind of went down to like this, almost like a snake motion, and yeah. it would go underneath and over um, some of the bearings, and it went over the pulley, and then back underneath, yeah, those two. And yeah. then these were actually two 3D printed parts with bearings inside. They were just press fit. 
Uh, oh, yeah, because we had to make this a bigger OD uh -huh. while we were running. So yeah. then the belt would go along this. It would go between these two. So then this this bearing here, these kind of bearings it's riding on, and these bearings here, um, in addition to these back bearings, right, would be what's actually, which all the rails are actually sliding on. Um, and then, like you said, the belt would come up over this pulley or over this bearing that's kind of acting like a pulley to redirect motion. Um, mm -hmm. And then all the way around the actual timing belt pulley, which is the only one that's actually engaging the teeth, um, and then back under here. Um, so this gets a nice big amount of wrap on the timing belt, so it's engaging lots of teeth. Um, and that timing belt is clamped up here, which is hidden somewhere. There's some sort of clamp. Okay. Um, I have no idea where it is. Somewhere in there. Um, there's a clamp, and there's one at the bottom as well. So this whole fixture stays still. As you're moving this, it's pulling on the belt, um, and it kind of almost likes like a flexible rack and pinion, or whatever you want to call it, and it's just moving that whole assembly up and down. Um, the plan was... The plan was to only have one motor, right? And then the shaft yeah, would go across and be... There should be two wheels. Yeah, I think it's just the way it was mirrored in this current assembly. Um, the shaft would go yeah, across yeah. and just power this belt. So this gear train and stuff wouldn't have to be there. Um, and we were just trying to figure out how to do this in the lightest way I think really it's possible. Not mirrored um, yeah, it's very possible this is not completely set up in the nicest way. I don't know what this floating thing is either, so we're all over the place. Um, I know what that is. Okay. Oh, wait, I know what that is too. Um, <laughs> that was some version of a color wheel mount or something that is just floating in space. Um, <laughs> that never actually happened. Um, yeah, so that was the goal for the forks. They were going to be held in tension. There would have been something to like, there would have been a hard stop to hit. Um, at some point, we got rid of, we had side bearings in here at one point, but we replaced them with just these parts, mm -hmm. which were going to be Delrin and bolted in to hold the rails in place. Um, as we knew there wasn't going to be too much, um, as we were moving them up and down, there wasn't going to be a lot of sideways forces at all. Um, so those could just be Delrin. And then once we were all the way at the bottom, these would get stopped somehow, so you couldn't pull them through tension. And then most of the load... Um, was going to be on this back set of bearings here and this front set of bearings because you have this robot sitting out underneath our robot over here kind of trying to tor turn this whole th assembly that way. Um, and we never really got through actually building the fork assembly and testing a lot of that because we, we assumed we'd be able to do that later and then eventually we just decided not to use it throughout the season anyway. Um, after seeing many other teams attempt these kind of climbs and them just not ever really working yeah. the way we wanted. Um, okay. Anything else that I've missed on this robot? We're now going into our pushing into our second hour or our third hour. <laughs> um, I think we caught most of it. Um, there's handles. So these handle plates are actually the, they're the same, even though this one is a little bit, this design is there kind of to mount some of the intake stuff. It has some holes for it but we left the same over here just so we reduced part count or unique part count. Um, and these just get wrapped with tape. At some point we had like discussed making like some 3D printed thing or something to make the handles easier, but tape on the quarter inch polycarb works well enough for the six millimeter polycarb. Um, some other mounts get in here. Um, I think we eventually actually, we drilled a hole here to mount a shaft all the way through this, right? Yeah. Um, so that we weren't just cantilevering here to be worried about this flexing a little bit, depending on what happened. So there's a full quarter inch bolt going all the way through this with spacers um, to support that other side. Um, some of the, you know, there was other, like, yeah, some of this mounting wasn't great. So like, even the climber mounting got a little awkward because we had to like figure out how to, um, did this get riveted or is this bolted? I don't even remember how this is mounted. It's bolted. It's bolted, right? Because we couldn't get a rivet because we'd already built part of the drive. So we didn't want to have to like go in and drill anything. Um, but ideally, we would figure out some future way to where we're not. We, if we mounted a two by one to this again, we would want something better. Even this like L is kind of lazily done, um, right? There's no, it helps a little bit in places, but there's definitely some version of this that ties it back better. Um, 
this upright wasn't isn't ideal, right? It does. There's no way to actually like. Um, there's no way to adjust anything. You can't. Um, you can't use it as a full tie rod or anything, because you can't adjust it. Um, but it makes it easier to mount this plate on than the circle or anything, because you can get nice zip tie holes that are constrained instead of just a rod, which allows them to slip. Uh, I think we covered almost every detail in this robot. Uh, 3047 is carved into the drivetrain. Oh, that is true. And that we were very, we, there was a, there there's definitely a fear that they were going to bend these or like bend them backwards or something. So we'd get like a 3838 drivetrain. Um, did any of them come out that way? Is one of them is like the practice spot wrong or something? Or do they all actually say 30? There, there's like two correct ones and like four wrong ones. Yeah, so they actually did come out wrong. So yeah, the, the comp bot has ones that actually say 3837. I think the practice bot doesn't. I think it says some other numbers. I think it says like 3838 on one side and 4747 on the other or something like that. Um, yeah, they could have been backwards. It could have been like 40. There's all sorts of things that could have been if they bent them in weird directions, which so they definitely did. Not, not. Um, ideally, we probably like that. That kind of stuff is not super useful, especially if we went to. If anyone's watched our Tuesday presentation, we started talking about like stiffening with dimples and stuff. That would not be there. That would be a dimple dyed plate to make that plate stiffer. Um, in if we actually make that happen, um, we can do very short, uh, tall, short thing. Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about tall short, Ethan? Sure. So on kickoff day, we had like a 30-minute conversation <laughs> about being tall or short. And we were like, oh, there's not really that much value we see in going short. So we decided to go tall. The main things uh, are the ball exits at a higher point. So uh, your arc, if you're more likely to make it into the goal. You have like a larger, like, margin of error that you are that you can be to go both into the two-point goal and the three-point goal. The fact that you're shooting from a higher point means that your shot is less likely to be blocked, but more importantly, your, our limelight was less likely to be blocked. And also, there's more space for things in general. You can do a one-stage elevator instead of, like, telescoping tubes or scissor lifts or anything. Virtual and, or all the other ones, yeah. Yeah, and, and because of more space, things can be less complex and more simple in general. Main reason uh, that we want to tell. Yeah, like all the electronics mounting gets relatively cleaner. There's some stuff we could have done to make that even more clean, but there's definitely it's easy enough to like have these nice side panels where we have mounting things. You get like nice convenient features just because you have extra room. Um, if we need to adapt and things, we can. Um, we also expected the buddy climb to be easier since we'd have these like these forks dropping down, that was some part of it, but it didn't weigh too much into it. Like a small buddy climb was almost impossible. Like in our minds, not gonna happen. Like there were some teams who attempted things that could have done it, um, but we didn't want to try to figure out how to build out any sort of like folding forks or anything out the bottom of a robot. You could have built a Wrangler. We could have built a Robo Wrangler that was on the list, but then you're figuring out how to wrangle people. And it took a while for that Q and A to come back as answered as it being legal to Velcro people and all of that stuff. Um, Right, that wasn't the first weekend. Um, let's see. Yeah, so these panels were just laser cut. I think they were like, they 16th polycarb, I think. They might have been eighth, but lightened. I don't remember exactly what they were. Um, but yeah, some of it is just because it looks nice and this, whoever the student designed it wanted to make pretty triangles, so we made pretty triangles, um, right? Like, there's no real reason why this couldn't have just been completely left full and been thinner or something as well, um, depending on how we rigid it. And a lot of this, we could have also put flanges on to make it a little stiffer, which we probably will do more in the future. Um, okay, any other things we wanna discuss? Um, there's definitely gonna be more as we discuss what we would change if we start making a 2021 version. Um, Drivetrain gets different because we probably would get rid of the Omni wheels, so we're not having to do any of the not dealing with broken Omnis. Just we're, we're way too abusive on the, um, yeah, we're way too um, aggressive going over the steel beams to keep the Omni wheels. Um, so we'd go to like a six wheel normal road drivetrain. Um, multiple teams had planned for that, 2056 being one of them. Um, and most things that are good enough for 2056 are good enough for everybody else. Um, 
I don't think I missed anything else. Um, anyone else have any last bits before I stop the recording? Okay. Um, oh, uh, this is our final one since we don't have any more robots. So I'm going to post this on Chief, or I'm going to post this on YouTube, and then I'll make a Chief post probably about all of them. Um, and if anyone has any questions about any of our robots, let us know, and we'll try to answer them.